So I'm very glad to welcome you all on our sixth seminar for this year, uh, the project of the Department of International Relations in our university, our School of uh, Economics, uh, the International Labor Laboratory on uh, World Order Studies and New Regionalism, and the Bulgarian Club in our university, uh, the European Integration and Eastern European Aspect uh, that is supervised by Professor Alexander Lukin. And our goal is to present the most pressing issues of the European Union in few lectures. Uh, my name is Stefan Stianov, and I am the Vice Chairman of the Bulgarian Club. And again, I'm going to be your host today. Uh, today, our guest is Martin Vodimiru. Uh, he is the Director of the Energy and Climate Program at the biggest Bulgarian think tank, the Center for Study of Democracy. And the topic of our seminar is again going to be very uh, re relevant uh, towards a new European energy and climate security strategy, the European Green Deal and key driver forward. Uh, Martin Vodimiro holds a master's degree in international affairs from the School of Advanced International Studies at John Hopkins University, a specialization in energy uh, resources and the environment and a bachelor's degree in economics and political science from the Adelphi University in New York. Uh, he works in the field of energy security in Europe and the Balkans, uh, energy transition, alternative energy technologies, as well as the geopolitical uh, dimensions of energy and uh, financial markets. Uh, he has been working in energy and political uh, ana ana analysis uh, for the last three years, both academically and professionally. And also he worked as an energy analyst for the oil and gas year, uh, where he completed two annual oil and gas reports for Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, and most recently uh, Saudi Arabia. And Mr. Vudimiro has also worked as an independent energy consultant for several projects for uh, international oil companies in the GCC and MENA countries. He's also an uh, affiliated expert at the European Geopolitical Forum in Brussels. Uh, and previously he worked as an energy and economic analyst for uh, CEE Market Watch, uh, where he was producing short intro daily an analysis for economic and energy issues for Iran and Central Asia. And we're also very glad uh, that um, Ilya Stepanov uh, is going to join our discussion as well. He's a well-known research fellow from our faculty, and he's also the deputy head of the Laboratory for Economics of Climate Change and the program academic supervisor of the program Environmental Econo Economics and Sustainable uh, Development. Well, uh, I think uh, we can start. Uh, Mr. Vodimirov. Thank you so much uh, for the invitation. and Thank you so much for the kind introduction. This is the first time I'm giving a talk at a Russian university, so it's a, it's a pleasure to, to be with you, even virtually. Um, my topic changed, changed a little bit, I think, over the last uh, couple of weeks. And I'll focus, um, I'll try to be as uh, most recent as possible in the, my presentation, and I'll share my screen in a moment. Um, I'd like to focus on, on the most recent uh, announcement by the European Union, by the European Commission. To revamp it in order to respond to the situation in uh, Eastern Europe, uh, more specifically to reduce the dependence on Russian natural gas and oil. Um, and uh, I'll try to, to talk a little bit more about this plan and whether this is possible, how possible is it is, uh, what are the risks involved in, in this calculus. Uh, and I'll try to be as brief as possible as to allow enough time for discussion. Uh, and now I'll share my, my screen for a little bit of uh, slides. Do you, do you see my screen? Uh, I think, yes, everything is okay. Um, so just, uh, just a very brief introduction of uh, what CSD does. Um, as, uh, um, as you mentioned, um, the Center for Study Democracy is the biggest and oldest think tank in Bulgaria. But um, 
What is more important is that even though the name is kind of misleading, we have been working a lot on energy policy in Europe over the past 15 years. We have tried to pioneer the topic of energy security and diversification, uh, not only in the Bulgarian debate, uh, but also on, on European level. Uh, and we have been uh, working with some of the most renowned institutes all across uh, Europe and the United States, dealing with the topic of energy security, um, uh, trying to measure it in a coherent way and design policies that actually uh, improve uh, energy security, reduce risks, uh, and in general, uh, uh, kind of prepares the economy for the shift towards decarbonization and low carbon transition. Um, so what are the main common energy security vulnerabilities in Europe? I'll briefly mention those, um, and then uh, we'll show you some, some results for selected uh, countries that might be more interesting to you, uh, you know, focusing on the um, Black Sea region. So uh, what is typical for, uh, 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 for Europe in general is that, um, you know, Europe depends quite significantly on the imports of energy resources. Um, and um, these imports also make up a significant share of household consumption. So it's not only a macro dependence uh, on oil, gas, coal, um, and minerals, uh, which are used for the renewable energy uh, power plants, but also even households directly depend a lot uh, um, on uh, both the, 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 the central transmission grid, uh, also the own imported fuels, um, this is especially true in natural gas, and uh, this is a vulnerability that um, you know has created significant problems in Europe over the years. Not only from a macroeconomic point of view, but also in terms of uh, um, uh, uh, political security, political stability, foreign influence, etc. Uh, another pattern that is still something Europe is grappling with is low energy efficiency. Of course, different countries across Europe have different. Um, uh, different levels of uh, uh, energy efficiency uh, and energy intensity in that sense. Uh, Eastern Europe, Central and Eastern Europe are much uh, less energy efficient than Western Europe. Um, and uh, But this gap in the different efficiency uh, rates has created also different path dependency in energy policy, different uh, objectives by different governments. Um, so coordination on European level has been a, a key priority in improving energy efficiency. Why is that important? Because when you increase energy efficiency, uh, you reduce energy imports. Uh, and, uh, uh, and in this way, you become more energy secure. Uh, limited energy market liberalization. Um, of course, the European market has consolidated significantly over the last 20 years. But uh, this is uh, uh, um, different uh, in different regions of Europe again, um, especially Southeast Europe and the Black Sea region has not been well liberalized, has not been well integrated within the European market. Um, and even in, in developed markets in Western Europe, uh, the energy crisis from 2021 uh, showed that national governments are quickly to respond to uh, pressure uh, you know, price pressure and uh, demand pressure with measures that limit market liberalization. Um, we have seen governments intervene on markets, uh, uh, you know, pressuring companies to reduce their profits, um, has subsidized prices, has uh, imposed uh, ceilings uh, on, on prices, uh, and on certain, uh, you know, flows of energy, so limiting exports and imports. So this is still a problem, and um, um, you know the agency for uh, the agency of energy regulators in Slovenia has published a major report late this year, late uh, 2021, saying that the best way to tackle the energy crisis that we're seeing right now is to improve uh, market liberalization and market integration, as to optimize uh, you know a different market, uh, different physical flows of energy across uh, the continent. I mentioned already uh, oil and gas dependence. Um, you know, when prices increase, by the way, this is, this is a key issue. When prices increase, uh, uh, Europe, unlike North America or, or even Asia to an extent, is much more vulnerable because it doesn't have an alternative. Um, so it needs to pay these huge bills for imports. 
and this so it reduces the competitiveness of European businesses uh, in comparison to you know, American businesses or Chinese uh, businesses. So it, it's key that um, you know, the, the security of supply issue is very much related to also the affordability of energy, so how expensive it is. And so the more uh, insecure uh, energy flows are, the higher the prices are. So things are interconnected. So there is this trilemma in energy security, which is, how do you make sure you have a, a, a reliable energy supply, which is at an affordable price? Uh, and in the European case, you have a third element to this, to this policy uh, uh, issue. And the third ele element is sustainability. So Europeans don't care only about price and reliability of supply. They also care about how carbon intensive is the energy. So, uh, uh, so there has been this shift towards uh, limiting coal gas use in the system, which has undermined significantly the stability of the system in certain periods of the year. And we have seen that in 2021 as well. Um, finally, and this is a, a, very, a, a kind of a sensitive issue, of course, um, the European energy security has suffered from uh, strategic corruption and state capture risks in which basically large uh, private companies uh, and, um, uh, and special interests have made sure the certain, a certain status quo is preserved. So for example, the coal lobby and the nuclear lobby have been able to preserve the dominance of these resources on the European energy market and basically forestall, basically prevent uh, the European Union to decarbonize its system a lot. I would say, and I'm very honest here, that also Russian companies have been very influential in um, uh, ensuring, using, I would say, corruption and state capture practices in preserving the dominance uh, uh, on certain markets, especially Gazprom, Rosneft, Nucleo. They have been very influential on the European market, but they have taken advantage basically of local governance deficits in Europe to, to achieve this uh, uh, you know, special political influence that they have. Um, and you know, knowing this big picture, we have tried to estimate what are the what are what is the energy security risk portfolio of different countries in Europe. And as you can see here, I have selected some Black Sea countries uh, and uh, the OECD average, so uh, the club of the rich, so to speak, countries. And as you can see here, um, obviously countries that depend a lot on the import of, of energy resources, like Bulgaria, Serbia. Uh, uh, Ukraine, um, um, Turkey, they score higher uh, on this graph, meaning that they are less secure. Uh, all of these countries, however, have seen their energy security improve uh, in the past 40 years or so, um, and they're closer to the OECD average. But, um, you know, this index is uh, made up of different categories. So you have oil and gas security, but you have also energy efficiency, transport intensity, uh, carbon emissions. So you have many, many different issues. So if you go down into the different categories, you have uh, you can see quite significant um, kind of variations. Uh, but obviously, uh, all countries are moving in the right direction. Probably the main factor that has been uh, preventing some of these countries, and uh, this applies to also other countries in Central and Eastern Europe, but probably the main issue has been the continued dependence uh, on oil and gas. Uh, uh, especially in Central and Eastern Europe. And the second thing is the low energy efficiency. These are the two things that these countries cannot really overcome uh, in the past two decades, despite uh, uh, you know, proclaimed energy policy strategy uh, about diversification, uh, about uh, improving the production, the local production of energy. And this, this is not only about shale gas or, or oil, but we're talking also about improving renewable energy production. So in many cases in Central and Eastern Europe, so far renewable energy integration has been slow to pick up speed. Focusing, and now I'll turn uh, um, only on natural gas or predominantly I'll speak uh, uh, about natural gas because of the situation uh, in Europe and the, and the EU policy to reduce its dependence on Russia. So it, you can see one of the kind of the uh, dimensions of these energy security risks is natural gas import security. Uh, and as you can see on this graph, um, you know, in 
In some countries in, in Europe, there hasn't been much change. Bulgaria remains the most vulnerable country in terms of natural gas import security, but also a very vulnerable are still Greece uh, and Germany, as you can see, has increased its vulnerability to uh, uh, to natural gas import uh, uh, security because Germany has become more and more dependent on one source of uh, natural gas, namely Russia. Uh, Germany consumes, as you know, 50% of its natural gas uh, from, from uh, one source, namely Russia. Uh, which is why it has been quite remarkable to see that Germany uh, is willing to uh, cancel Nord Stream 2 and also uh, uh, start working on diversifying its portfolio. It will be very difficult, I would say, to do this quickly, uh, but it seems that the uh, German public opinion on, on natural gas security has been changing. Uh, generally speaking, the whole EU has become more dependent uh, on natural gas uh, as you can see on this graph. So uh, this is just a map showing the different levels of uh, natural gas dependence uh, on, on Russia uh, in Europe. And um, you know some countries have been better prepared. They have done their homework uh, uh, to reduce the dependence on Russia. But as you can see, uh, this picture is not so different if we compare it from today to 2009, mainly Central and Eastern Europe remain quite significantly dependent on Russia, and this has not really changed. The big change is, of course, Ukraine, which stopped uh, uh, getting gas directly from Russia. But to be honest, most of the, the gas that Ukraine receives uh, uh, is also Russian. It just comes from the west, west east direction. Um, so how can Europe reduce its dependence on Russian gas? This is the big question that all Europeans are now asking themselves. Um, for obvious reasons. Um, so the big, the big problem here is the short-term risk of actually not being able to supply enough gas to, to final consumers. The reason is that um, natural gas storage facilities uh, are currently at all-time low levels, so stocks are, uh, are depleted. Uh, they're currently at 24%, uh, which is uh, a record low. Usually at that time of the year, they are around 40% filled. Um, and as you can see, most of the natural gas storage capacity is uh, located in five countries. Um, three of those countries are heavily dependent on Russian gas. So part of the reason why the, their storages have been depleted much more, much more quickly than, than expected in, in the winter of 2021 is because Russian gas transit in 2021 uh, uh, was lower than expected uh, for these countries. So they were not able to uh, uh, fill their storages at an appropriate level by October 2021, which is why now we have this, this issue. And this is one of the main reasons for the high prices that we see on, on, on the natural gas markets in Europe. So uh, the main task of the European Union over the next six months would be to uh, increase the level of gas storage, uh, 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 you know, capacity inventory to uh, at least 86 percent, 84, 86 percent. That's the target that they're aiming at, which um, still is a bit lower than than needed, but uh, would be enough to uh, 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 kind of satisfy domestic gas consumption uh, in the next winter period. Uh, having said that. Uh, you know, achieving this target without Russian gas um, would be close to impossible. So it will be very, very difficult to uh, to increase the level of gas stocks in the in the storages without Russian gas. And I'll tell you now a little bit more how Europe plans to do it, anyways. Uh, the key answer to this uh, conundrum, to this dilemma, would be uh, liquefied natural gas. Uh, this is what um, this is what really uh, Europe wants to do in order to uh, bridge the gap between supply and demand from the gas market. Um, but uh, here there are also significant problems, um, and it's not really clear how the EU is going to attract so much uh, LNG uh, to the European market as planned. Um, now, the idea is to bring 50 billion cubic meters more LNG to Europe uh, in 2022 than in 2021. 
Um, and most of this gas would come from two sources, United States and Qatar. But uh, notice here that uh, Russia is also a very big exporter of LNG to Europe, especially to Western Europe, France, and, um, and Spain. Uh, so uh, if we exclude Russian LNG here, um, it's, it becomes really an impossible task to get 50 billion cubic meters more. The reason why this is the case is that most of the LNG that is uh, sold on the global market goes to Asia and goes to Asia on long-term contracts. Uh, actually, the, the LNG available on the global market for sale on spot prices is only around 25, 30% of the total. So Europe will be competing for very small amounts of natural gas and um, even the, and these volumes are not enough to replace the whole Russian gas supply. Um, my estimate is that uh, um, US and Qatar and Australian LNG could uh, maybe replace 75% um, of the Russian gas, maybe 60, well, two thirds to three quarters of the Russian gas. Uh, but this is the most optimistic scenario. Uh, as you can see here on this map, most of the uh, regasification facilities used for the import of LNG are located in Western Europe, which is problematic because uh, um, if there is a gas supply disruption from Russia, uh, you know, the hardest hit countries would be in Central and Eastern Europe, but most of the capacity for imports will be in Western Europe, meaning that basically it will be very difficult to ship this natural gas from Western Europe to Eastern Europe. So Central and Eastern Europe would face a much more difficult period uh, uh, than, than Western Europe. Western Europe is more secure, could much more easily get the necessary volumes, but Central and Eastern Europe might actually experience uh, uh, significant gas supply deficits and changes in the consumption patterns. Uh, uh, for example, district heating companies, Tupufikatsi, uh, as they're known, uh, uh, or uh, the industry might need to uh, close down production. Uh, so as I mentioned, LNG is unlikely to be enough. As you can see on this graph, um, in December, you could see in December and January, uh, you could see a huge increase in the utilization of LNG terminals for regasification. Uh, and even, even after this, even when they were used at 100%, um, uh, uh, Europe had to import enormous volumes of Russian gas in order to satisfy the domestic consumption. This means that basically uh, um, we don't have enough uh, uh, capacity to, to import LNG, uh, even if we tried our hardest. Uh, so it will be very, very difficult uh, to, to implement this, these changes without many more reforms and many more steps. And what could be done more than, than, than just LNG? Um, one way is to increase domestic natural gas production. But as you can see on this graph, domestic European natural gas production has been going down uh, over the past decade significantly from around 130 billion cubic meters to less than 50 billion cubic meters um, uh, this year. But the main reason is that the Dutch gas production has been uh, uh, stopped or has been, uh, I mean, has been gradually shutting down uh, because of environmental risks, uh, earthquake risks, etc. But I assume that in 2022, Dutch gas production would actually increase a little bit. Danish production could increase a little bit. So if you lower environmental restrictions on these, um, uh, you know, gas fields. Uh, there could be some increase in natural gas production. So some of the deficits from uh, reducing the Russian gas supply could come from domestic uh, production in Europe, but we are talking about not more than 10 billion cubic meters. So this is just a drop in the bucket, so to speak. Um, this is a summary table showing what are the different measures that European, the European Union wants to implement to achieve uh, uh, its objective. Um, and as I mentioned, of course, LNG uh, is, is the main thing, uh, but uh, you need also to change in general the way people consume energy. Uh, 
Europe really hopes that it can um, kind of, um, it can ask European consumers to uh, lower the, the use of natural gas in their homes. One way to do that is to become more energy efficient, but this is of course more difficult and more long-term. Just a, a very short-term objective is to ask citizens to lower their thermostat uh, by one degree, you know? So live, live a little bit colder at home, uh, which is of course uh, difficult to, uh, to convince people to do, but still it's, a, it's an option. Uh, lowering temperature by one, one degree uh, could uh, save um, 14 billion cubic meters um, um, of natural gas. So, you know, 14 billion cubic meters less Russian gas, maybe. Uh, another, another thing that is very, very important is to increase the use of renewable energy sources, uh, especially in the electricity sector. As you probably know, uh, Europe has become more and more dependent on natural gas to produce electricity. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why uh, in 2021, we had this spike uh, in, uh, in gas prices because as coal-fired power plants were closing all across uh, Europe, they were replaced by natural gas. So one way to uh, uh, kind of solve this gas dependence in the power sector is to increase the role of uh, offshore wind in general, wind power generation. Uh, and Germany, uh, you know, generally northern countries, northwestern countries are ready to, uh, 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 you know, start working on many uh, wind projects. Of course, this takes time, but it's possible to uh, kind of prioritize wind and solar uh, uh, capacity instead of gas uh, in the next six, eight months. And in this way, you can save another 20 billion cubic meters. Uh, finally, industry. Uh, the industry would be hardest hit by a gas supply disruption from Russia because it doesn't really have many options. Um, so one way to kind of uh, help reduce gas consumption in the industry is to create a scheme that would incentivize companies to shut down production temporarily for some time, for a week, for example, and they will be compensated with, uh, with, with a certain you know, subsidy from the government. This can be done using tenders or in a competitive manner. Um, approach that has been promoted by the European Commission in the electricity market. Now it can be used much more aggressively in the natural gas market. So the industry could uh, potentially reduce some of its uh, gas consumption as well. So that's how uh, we see the gas supply outlook uh, for 2022. If the European Union uh, tries to implement all of these measures, as you can see, even after the measures, even after the LNG uh, and the, the domestic gas production, uh, Russian gas still would be, um, you know, consisting of around uh, uh, you know, 25% of the natural gas consumption of Europe by the end of the, of the gas year, so by September 2022. Um, so we'll see what happens. As, uh, uh, um, uh, as President Trump, Trump used to say, we'll see what happens. Um, but uh, obviously, the, the objective is to lower the amount of gas that is consumed, especially through Nord Stream 1, uh, Yamal, um, so we'll see. One, by the way, one way to also increase um, uh, non-Russian gas um, in Europe would be to increase some of the supply from North Africa. Um, Algier, uh, Algeria has capacity to increase some of its production there a little bit and use some of the uh, pipelines that are empty right now that they go to Italy and uh, Spain. Um, so this is one way to, to also increase non-Russian gas. This is just a picture of the gas supply demand, uh, gas supply and demand from different regions um, uh, and from different industries and different consumption uh, uh, kind of sectors. Um, and as you can see, um, um, the goal is to increase gas storage significantly. So in order to do that, you need all the gas supply available, but you also need to limit consumption uh, more, more significantly in the power sector, I would say, but also in the heating, uh, so in buildings. So, um, so what, can, what, what can happen 
uh, alternatively, how how would this whole energy crisis, um, uh, uh, you know, impact the energy system in general? Not only gas, but but the whole uh, the whole energy system. So one one way that Europeans were looking to um, you know fix the situation is to increase the output of nuclear energy. Um, especially France has said that has uh, already uh, kind of stated its ambition to increase nuclear power plant uh, capacity over the next two decades. But this is very difficult to achieve. And as I see, as, as I'm showing here in this graph, uh, actually French nuclear output, you know, France is the biggest nuclear power producer in Europe. Uh, French nuclear output has been going down uh, over the last decade. Uh, and it will be very difficult to stabilize it and to uh, and to increase it in the future because the investment is enormous. These projects are very difficult to implement uh, and they take a long time to actually uh, become operational. Apart from France, there isn't even uh, there isn't really another country that could increase nuclear power. Um, uh, one one possibility is, of course, Finland. Finland is uh, finishing up a nuclear power plant, uh, by the way, using uh, um, new, uh, Russian technology. Uh, Hungary is building a nuclear power plant, but the project is very, very, very delayed, uh, Paks too. Um, so, and uh, the Czech Republic, uh, Czechia also is looking to increase some nuclear power uh, uh, generation, but uh, it's very far from actually achieving this objective. So this, in the, in the medium term, until 2030, nuclear power is not really an option. So what happens is that the paradox, um, when gas prices are so high, the paradox for Europe has been that many countries had to turn on their coal plants, basically. Um, because, uh, you know, just the natural gas plants are no longer affordable in terms of the price of electricity produced. And coal-fired power generation became uh, more competitive as uh, CO2 emission prices uh, did not uh, rise as high as natural gas prices rose. So as you can see the picture here uh, in 2021, you have seen you can see an 18% increase in coal-fired power generation um, year on year, and the projections for 2022 are similar. So more coal uh, uh, than usual and less gas. Um, in a way, you know, in a paradoxical way, increasing coal uh, power generation would reduce the dependence on Russian gas, uh, but it would undermine the, the big uh, kind of long-term objective that the European Union has, which is 100% decarbonization of the electricity system. Um, Europe wants to basically eliminate coal and natural gas from, from its mix, by 2023, uh, uh, sorry, by 2035, um, my mistake. And in order to do this, you need to invest enormous amounts of capital in renewable energy, storage technologies, hydrogen. Uh, and um, what we have seen is that because the price of all materials and all minerals has been uh, increasing, it will be, uh, much more difficult for investors to justify such projects in the next five years or so, uh, which I believe would mean that uh, the whole renewable energy transition in, in Europe would slow down. It would not be stopped, but it will be slowed down. Uh, and this has implications for gas again. Uh, uh, Europe, um, even if it doesn't want to, to do it, would need to uh, use more gas in the next five, six years. And uh, uh, in order to not do it, it would have to pay a much higher price. So it's, a, it's always, you know, in energy policy in general, it's always a question of, of choices, uh, questions of opportunity costs. What, what makes sense now might not make sense in five years. Uh, so now it makes sense to use more coal, uh, uh, but in five years, it might, might make sense to use more gas. So it, it, it is very unpredictable the situation. One, one thing is clear, Europe would not stop decarbonizing its energy system, but who will pay the price? Is it going to be households? Is it going to be uh, uh, industry? 
Uh, is it going to be uh, investors? Is it going to be national budgets? Someone will pay the price. Um, one of the one of the uh, actors, one of the stakeholders that might be actually go, might actually pay the price is also Russia, because Europe cannot achieve both energy independence and energy transition if it consumes a lot of Russian gas. So. Um, in the long run, uh, Russia might need to think about diversifying its, uh, uh, its market as well, because currently Russia depends excessively on Europe, uh, both for the sale of natural gas and oil. Uh, and, you know, you ha we have seen Russia trying to uh, uh, sell much more gas and oil to China uh, and, other, uh, and other countries, but this process is, has been slow, and there, there's still much more to be done for Russia to become really independent from its own financial dependence on Europe. So what are the, uh, just kind of a, to, to finish up the, the, the presentation, what are the main elements of uh, the European energy and climate security strategy? So one thing, coal phase out, um, even, even, even if Europe doesn't uh, see that as uh, profitable right now, uh, it's very difficult considering the situation with the gas supply it wants to call, to phase out coal. So it doesn't want to switch on coal power plants. Uh, it does it, so Germany does it only because there is no other choice. So if natural gas prices go down, it's more likely that coal, coal power plants will go out of business uh, again. So another thing is to avoid the natural gas lock-in. So the European Union is very careful not to allow natural gas projects to continue uh, uh, in many parts of, uh, of the continent, but especially in Central and, and, and Eastern Europe. In Central and Eastern Europe, governments have tried to uh, 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 propose different new natural gas projects, including natural gas transmission lines, uh, power plants, um, you know, blue hydrogen production facilities, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and it has been very difficult for the EU to stop this process in Central and Eastern Europe, but it is trying to do it uh, anyways. Uh, as I mentioned, the cutting of the dependence on Russian natural, natural gas, I'm not going to speculate more on that. Renewable energy uptake, this is really the main, the main goal, but it's, uh, it's very difficult, as I mentioned, because it's very expensive. And right now there is little appetite to increase the rate of investment uh, at the moment. With certain, with certain exceptions, of course. In order for the renewable energy transition to, to succeed, we need a much better power grid because you know renewable energy sources are intermittent. So sometimes it's not sunny, sometimes the wind is not blowing. So the, 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 the power transmission lines uh, have to be uh, um, more secure and they have to be able to integrate this enormous amount of new renewable energies without compromising uh, the security of supply of electricity. Uh, uh, so it is uh, important to invest in smart grids, uh, in modernization of the existing uh, power lines, in digitalization, uh, in the better integration of markets in Europe. So all, all of these boring things that Europeans uh, need to step up uh, uh, their game in order to, to, to make the system resilient. As I mentioned, uh, improving energy efficiency is key uh, because I didn't show this graph, but um, uh, you know, there is a projection that basically without significant energy efficiency measures, natural gas consumption is not going to decrease uh, uh, almost at all by, uh, by 2030. So if, if we want to remove fossil fuels, both coal and gas, we need to improve energy efficiency. And finally, uh, in order for this strategy to succeed, you need to reduce energy poverty. Uh, uh, 50 million people in Europe suffer from energy poverty at the moment. And this share of the, of the EU population is going to increase uh, over the next 12 months because these high prices of oil, gas, and electricity would sooner or later uh, lead to, uh, uh, you know, to the destabilization of household incomes and household budgets. Uh, so the European Union needs to invest much more in, uh, 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 in reducing energy poverty, so increasing subsidies directly to households, but also incentivizing households to become more energy efficient, uh, to change to a, a source of electricity or a source of energy uh, supply that is more uh, 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 sustainable, 
So one way to do that is to increase the share of heat pumps uh, in the consumption or to reduce the use of uh, firewood and coal. In Central and Eastern Europe, still many households use firewood and coal for heating. Uh, but this, this requires a, a monumental shift in also energy behavior, and you, you cannot change energy behavior in 12 months. You need years of, of, of concentrated and dedicated national and EU uh, uh, kind of um, uh, uh, policies. So with that, uh, I'm finishing up and um, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Vladimir. And uh, now, Mr. Uh, Stepan, we would love to uh, you, we would love to hear your thoughts. Can you turn? Uh -huh. uh, yes, thank you, Stefan. Thank you, Martin, very much for comprehensive uh, sort of overview analytical report on the energy security. I think I will continue discussion on the implications of the current situation and what is happening with the energy and climate policy. And the key message here, I think, that you mentioned also that um, that, to, that climate policies in European Union historically go hand in hand with the policy for ensuring energy security, re reducing dependence on foreign imports of fossil fuels, like diversification of these imports, as you also said. So the goal is to reduce this dependence and increase energy efficiency, and by this end, consume less energy producing the same amount of goods and services and develop alternatives like wind and solar. So in this sort of framework, uh, energy policy really go in ha hand in hand with ambitious targets to achieve carbon neutrality by the year of 2050, and which basically underlie, uh, underlie European Green Deal. And this is a good strategy, but, but I also see that this energy security trilemma at the same time uh, have some vulnerabilities. And if we analyze the current situation and how this sort of a uh, political tension and crisis and relations between European Union and Russia could influence uh, the energy security and climate policy issue, I think we should distinguish sort of long run implication and short run implication. Long, long run implication, they are more policy driven and sort of lessons learned driven while the short-run implications are more sort of market-driven and the, um, the market forces that now in the short-run could influence. So, and I agree that the, 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 in the current situation, these um, tensions uh, between uh, two sides uh, could give additional incentive for an, uh, European policymakers and generally give uh, momentum to European Green Deal policy uh, now energy security concerns are becoming really more evident as they were before and the whole energy security of the European Union is at stake considering, considering both uh, uh, Russian uh, proclamations and European proclamations uh, and the risks of total embargo and this is uh, obviously uh, a tremendous effect for both sides and we can take we can just take a look at the prices, as you said, on natural gas and even on coal today. So the logic that it could give momentum to European Green Deal uh, and incentivize uh, energy transition in the long run of European Union, uh, because it's just sort of economically rational, not only politically. So this further stimulates um, the carbon markets and EU ETS carbon price. Uh, and interfuel competition favoring uh, less carbon intense sources. However, if we take a look at the short term uh, period, I would say that the situation could play out in the opposite uh, direction and there could be a really lag in implementing this kind of goals, uh, which already uh, set and there could be uh, market forces which could overplay the political, uh, I would say, political uh, intentions that uh, European Union has. has. So in, in, in the short run, the situation could really work vice versa and the consumption of coal could increase as it was, uh, for example, after the crisis of 2008, 2009. And it was a period of a couple of years when um, EU imported more coal from uh, United States of America, and we, we also see the period after 2014 when the coal consumption increased, and therefore emissions 
actually increased in European Union and was uh, sort of a unprecedented, at least for uh, for, for, for decades, uh, which um, were marked with uh, active climate policies and some success on this way. And when these crises and market forces sort of emerge rapidly and this political pathway sometimes could be really, uh, could become a risk. So, uh, and today uh, at the same time, we see what is happening uh, with the UETS and the price for carbon allowances. I think they decreased by third uh even taking into account that the prices for energy sources have just soared up uh and the price for carbon credits go absolutely in the opposite direction and decrease i'm not sure but I, at least by third so and there could be just purely market explanation why, why it is happening it's not the regulatory things uh maybe they could play out in the future but today for example there could be an explanation that the companies uh, just really are searching for a liquidity to be able to pay for more expensive gas and electricity in the European Union. And this kind of really uh, expensive uh, credits could be used as a cash for their operational needs uh, because the conditions work uh, in, in, in this way. So and the second, they could be that the companies anticipate that the demand for carbon credits will fall down as the uh, due to high energy prices and outbreaking crisis uh, and this this may lead to reduced operation rates and so they also are driven by expectation so however i uh, generally uh, think that in the longer run the crisis will indeed provoke most stringent stringent uh, climate policies and the use of incentive-based instruments, and I think I, I here would be grateful to hear you, Martin, opinion uh, on 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 how long could it take to switch from from these short-term incentives and market forces towards this, I would say, long-term policy-driven uh, framework, which will uh, bring Europeans back to uh, growing um, EU ETS prices. Uh, that uh, there would be a more space for, I would say, environmental and sustainability component, because I think at least for one or two years, there would be less restrictions just because of social and economic needs and our environmental reasons would be sort of a, uh, a little bit moved down on the agenda list, uh, at, at, at least to my, to, my, to my mind. However, in the future, I think that we could sometimes come to mutually beneficial cooperation, which, uh, of course, not only lying in the domain of trade in oil and natural gas, there are amount of opportunities, a certain amount of opportunities which could be exploited uh, if we take a look at the potential of joint mitigation actions, because Russia has a huge potential for cheap emissions reduction. Uh, and Europe uh, already for 30 years are realizing ambitious climate policies and the um, uh, potential for really cheap emissions reduction are to a large extent already exploited and it's becoming more and more expensive as they go uh, up at the marginal abutment cost. And there are various estimates that uh, it is China, India and Russia, which is countries where it is really cost efficient um, emissions reduction policies could be realized. And there is a room for joint cross-border cooperation, uh, which we already had actually during the Kyoto Protocol, when there would be a couple of projects which provided uh, incentives uh, and for Russian companies to implement uh, low carbon solutions and reduce emissions. And, and this could be uh, done some, sometime. So I think I'll, I'll finish up here and I'll be really uh, grateful to hear on this, um, I would say delay in uh, policy implementation on the way to European Green Deal uh, and to which extent this market forces can really uh, roll back the uh, climate and energy plans of European Union. You partly said about this, but do you think on the time frame here Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Thank, Thank you so much. This was a really interesting um, viewpoint. Um, I think that these high power prices uh, in Europe and high gas prices, for that matter, uh, would incentivize um, private investment in renewable energy sources. Uh, we have seen that uh, we have seen a pickup in um, industry-based investment in renewable energy and storage. So, meaning that companies try to minimize, reduce their costs for electricity and gas by uh, um, developing their own, for example, solar park uh, or wind park uh, that would supply electricity for their own production purposes. Uh, the attractiveness also of storage technologies is rising across Europe. Uh, again, businesses, especially large businesses, take advantage of storage technologies in order to optimize uh, their consumption and production patterns. Uh, so produce renewable energy uh, when the sun is shining, for example, storing it uh, during the weekend and then using it during the uh, peak production uh, uh, periods. Um, of the week. So these kinds of new business approaches to renewable energy uh, and to changing of uh, production patterns is uh, it's visible across Europe. It's not enough. Of course, it's not enough because um, not all businesses are able to switch to renewable energy, uh, especially gas intensive businesses like petrochemicals, like, like glass making. Uh, companies, steel, cement, all of these, um, uh, all of these industries would still depend a lot on, on the use of uh, fossil fuels. Uh, and this pattern is not going to change. So they'll be hit, uh, their competitiveness would, would, would go down. And of course, there is a lot of policy push, as I mentioned, from the, especially from the coal lobby and the gas lobby to, to increase the role of fossil fuels. Uh, in the energy mix, um, but uh, I think the European Union is uh, trying to prevent this lock-in by uh, allowing governments to use the revenues from selling CO2 emissions much more aggressively to support renewable energy investments. Um, the European Commission uh, uh, president uh, actually said that in September 2021, uh, directly, uh, you know, urging governments to use the accumulation of the funds to uh, finance a much bigger renewable energy projects, also to finance um, households-based decentralization. So one of the one of the big kind of trends in Europe is that households are becoming increasingly more independent from the transmission from the main uh, energy systems, both electricity and gas. Um, so the, the, the number of, uh, of uh, uh, independent households and small businesses is rising all across Europe. Uh, we have seen the emergence of energy cooperatives, uh, even in vulnerable group communities. So, uh, so this is a long-term process that I think is already impacting the energy system on the whole. Uh, you, have, you can see in certain periods of the year, especially in the, in the summer, that countries like Germany, uh, Denmark, um, the UK, uh, Austria, they, they, they have uh, close to negative prices. I mean, I'm not talking about 2021 because 2021 is a very special year. It's very, it's changed a lot the, the energy portfolio. But if we go back to a, to a period uh, without high natural gas prices, we had a different story. We had negative electricity prices. We had. Uh, actually, uh, incentives for uh, 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 for countries to invest much more in renewable energy because they saw how this decreases costs significantly, both for households and businesses. So I don't think this logic has disappeared. But as you mentioned, the short-term risk uh, is that um, in order to be to secure energy supply, in order to reduce the costs. Uh, government might uh, uh, switch to the use of coal. You, you're correct that um, CO2 prices have gone down uh, recently. One of the one of the reasons why why this is happening, I think, is that um, the industry has been cutting on production. So basically, they're trying to minimize uh, uh, production um, because of the high prices of electricity and gas. So the demand from the industry for CO2 emissions is lower right now. 
but this could be one one explanation. One is the expectation. Another is the expectation, of course, that you mentioned. Uh, so uh, let's see what happens. Look, uh, the European Commission uh, introduced a new taxonomy for for projects, and uh, it kind of it included under certain circumstances uh, natural gas and nuclear in this taxonomy. So uh, governments would be eligible to receive EU funding for natural gas and nuclear. But even, even after this decision, I don't think that many governments would actually build large scale projects like nuclear power plants or gas fired power generation. It just doesn't make economic sense anymore. Um, no one believes that these high power prices would stay the same in the next 10 years. So most investors expect that in a couple of years or even earlier, we'll see the, uh, going back to the normal, basically to a situation of you know, relatively low and stable power prices. And when this happens, the, the main logic would be to take advantage of the enormous renewable energy potential that is, being, uh, uh, is not being exploited to the fullest extent. So um, I've, I, see, I see one aspect that is growing by leaps and bounds, and it's probably going to drive the, the renewable energy transition in Europe uh, uh, over the next decade. And this is the, the introduction of cutting edge technologies like offshore wind, including floating offshore wind. This is, this is a key priority for, for the European Union because offshore wind is providing electricity at almost a base load level, base load capacity. So it is close in terms of production profile, like a gas uh, plant um, or a coal plant. And this is, uh, the, there is the big hope that uh, especially uh, uh, countries with access to the sea are going to benefit from, uh, from increasing the capacity of offshore wind and combining that with green hydrogen. So the, the production of hydrogen using the electricity from offshore wind. Uh, so um, to kind of uh, uh, increase uh, 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 hydrogen uh, hand in hand with renewable energy. You know, Russia had a big plan uh, to basically use its natural gas pipelines to bring hydrogen to Europe in the future. Uh, and this plan is not over, of course, and there are, there are many countries in Europe that still think that one of the cheapest way to decarbonize the energy system is to produce hydrogen from natural gas. But um, I, I have to be really honest. First of all, because of the political situation, I don't think this is already feasible. The, this is, I think, this is this story is going to end. And, and, second, and second of all, uh, unfortunately, environmental um, groups in Europe and environmental political parties in, in Europe uh, uh, are bent on preventing blue hydrogen to, to, to take hold. Uh, so they, they think that this is no go. So, so we shouldn't use fossil fuels to, to, to produce hydrogen, which might not make economic sense. Uh, because blue hydrogen is more cost effective, but it just doesn't make political sense nowadays in Europe. So it will be very difficult to do that. Um, so this is one, and, and the third element, the third element for, uh, um, for future investment in, in the medium to long term is storage. So basically Europe thinks that it can solve its renewable energy problem. So the, the fact that renewable energy is not stable in terms of production profiles, by investing in huge amounts of storage all across Europe. Uh, um, but um, this could be uh, going in the in a wrong direction right now because the prices of the metals used for the for the production of batteries has, has risen so much. And a lot of these metals are concentrated in the hands of a few number of countries, including Russia, China, uh, you know, African countries. Uh, there is so much supply risk with uh, with these materials that uh, I don't think that uh, battery storage could uh, remain uh, as competitive uh, 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 as Europeans want it to be uh, in the next decade or so. We'll see because storage technology has been going down in terms of price, but uh, uh, this whole thing was reversed last year. I think uh, prices just got went up again. Uh, so uh, let's see if these investment plans actually materialize. So these are kind of the three elements I mentioned, offshore wind storage, uh, offshore wind storage and hydrogen, basically. 
So, Mr. Stepanov, thank you very much. So, Mr. Stepanov, do you want to add something or we should continue with the QA section? Let's continue, maybe later. Thank you, Martin, for your answers. Oh, uh, well, then, thank you very much, both. It was very interesting. And um, of course, it, it is wonderful to listen uh, to you uh, even more. Uh, but again, let's head to our QA section. I want to address our audience. You can ask questions by raising your hand or uh, writing them in the uh, chat section. And I actually want to start with a question um, from my experience when a few Bulgarians gather around and start talking about energy, it always comes to South Stream in the end. Uh, because I, if I'm not mistaken, we've closed this project eight years ago, but still, um, this we still we, we do not have consen consensus in our society about it but this is only an example uh, my question is um isn't it better for each country to pursue its own national energy policy because yes we are very alike but still we have different governments uh, our goals are, are different our capabilities are different or it is it, it is better to have a unified policy and pursue those absolute goals that we receive from the European Union as the union itself, rather than the re relative ones. Uh, feel free both to answer. Uh, let me unmute you. Well, um, yeah, South Stream, yeah. <laughs> what, what can I tell you? South Stream was a very corrupt project, sorry to say that. Uh, and it was used uh, by both Russian and domestic uh, um, oligarchic networks to enrich themselves and also to increase um, the Russian influence, the Russian economic and political influence in Southeast Europe. Um, the project was stopped, but it wasn't killed. So it was replaced by Turk Stream. And Turkstream was successful. So um, Turkstream went under the radar and basically uh, was pursued by all the governments in Southeast Europe uh, as a reliable replacement of the current gas transmission network from Russia. Um, and the way, the way the whole story was played was to present this project as actually the expansion of local domestic you know, gas transmission networks, which was a smart trick to convince the European Union not to stop the project. Uh, you're absolutely right that uh, EU governments have, um, um, uh, you know, control their national energy policy. So the EU should not uh, intervene in their energy policy, but this is only on paper. In reality, uh, the way the EU functions makes it impossible for governments to be uh, absolutely independent in their energy policy mix um, because there are instruments on EU level to, uh, uh, to shift, uh, you know, decisions, policy decisions. Uh, one, and, and Ilya talked about that, one very important instrument is, of course, the price of CO2. So basically, even though governments choose their energy mix, uh, when your coal-fired power plants are not uh, economically viable, you stop them. And basically many countries in Europe stop their coal-fired power plants. Um, uh, so this is, this is one point. And in terms of gas, you know, the European Union has very strict rules on competition uh, and market integration. And these rules have been kind of avoided by some countries, but uh, generally speaking, it is very difficult to um, uh, have projects that undermine the security of supply in Europe, which is why it, it was so difficult for Russia to complete Nord Stream 2 and Turk Stream because they undermine the security of supply of Europe according to the rules of the European Union. I'm not talking about here about politics, I'm talking about the rules. And, uh, and these projects just do not, are not consistent with uh, um, with the natural gas uh, competition policy of the European Union, which means that the owner of the pipeline and, uh, uh, and the owner of the gas should be different companies, basically. And, and these Russian products, although they try to circumvent the rules a little bit, they don't really comply with the, with the spirit of this law. In the end of the day, it's Russian gas. 
going through Russian pipelines, more or less. Even, even when these pipelines are built by, by local governments, uh, uh, usually they're built with, with Russian money or there are Russian companies involved. So in the end of the day, it's the same goal. The European Union closed its eyes to that because it needed the Russian gas more than, uh, than uh, uh, it was willing to, to kind of enforce the rules. But today the situation is completely different. So it will be very difficult to continue this kind of business uh, relationship in the future. But TurkStream is a done deal. So TurkStream, it will be difficult to stop TurkStream. Obviously TurkStream will continue to, be, to play a major role. Um, but Nord Stream 2, I, I, I don't see any future for that project, at least for now. We'll see. Mr. Stefano, do you want to add something? I'll just have a short add-on. I, I don't think that sort of independent, uh, I would say, energy policy at the country level is politically feasible because all the decades that the European Union developed as a political project is sort of is, is dedicated towards to make energy policy more sort of um, union question or union issue rather than, of course, it could be a specific negotiation between union and different countries because we, I, I'm not an expert in Bulgarian energy policy, but we see the case of Poland where the situation of coal production and consumption is like dramatically sort of impeding the ambitions of uh, European Union. And there could be some sort of um, uh, negotiations because uh, Poland is a kind of an exceptional case. And I think at this level, there could be some independence in the way and of individual economies. But generally speaking, I don't see any sort of political room for um, Bulgaria to be sort of energy independent and have its own specific course because uh, at political level, it's not the, 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 the issue to be discussed right now, at least. Maybe in 10, 20 years could change, but it's, it's not a framework of, of, of today's mindset of policymakers in the European Union, at least from, from my opinion. Thank you very much. We have two questions and one in the chat section. Uh, first is Georgi Ivanov. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the lecture. It was uh, very interesting for us. Um, I would like to ask one question, which is uh, related more to the, uh, which is related to more of the global issues nowadays. Um, you talked about a lot of, uh, you talked a lot about uh, the European energy security, but um, what could be said on the same topic about the countries in the other regions. Um, we see that the Biden administration is trying in every possible way to cut um, all Russian imports of energy resources. Um, recently, the US conducted negotiations with uh, Maduro on new oil imports from Venezuela. Um, on the other hand, Al Jazeera reported that uh, the United Arab Emirates and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia have refused to conduct um, such negotiations with the US. And the situation with Tehran is pretty similar. Um, and in all these cases, it is obvious that the United States is trying to restore its damaged uh, relations uh, with these enemy countries. Uh, my question is, which of these countries, in your opinion, could become an alternative to the Russian oil and gas, um, which, uh, which were imported uh, in the USA before uh, USA's uh, latest sanctions? Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm just going to meet you both. Feel free to answer. Well, I'm I think the Biden administration is um, grappling with domestic political issues. Um, the price of gasoline in the US has been rising significantly because of the, the increase of uh, crude oil prices. And this is a very sensitive political issue in the United States. It can actually uh, lead to uh, Biden losing the elections. Uh, and Biden has a very low uh, popularity uh, rating these days, so he's looking for any option to stabilize that. Um, he understands that if there is a major disruption of oil and gas, 
exports from Russia, uh, this would send oil and gas prices into the stratosphere. To be honest, they're already so high uh, that it is currently, he's, he's basically currently just trying to reduce, minimize the damage. Um, this is, I think, the explanation why um, uh, the US is planning to lift sanctions on, on Venezuela. This is, this is a really, um, you know, this was a surprise move for me as well because the US was very, very, very determined to, 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 to uh, maintain sanctions on Maduro. Um, this is also the, uh, the attempt in, in the Gulf, uh, in the UAE, in Saudi Arabia. Um, they are trying to stabilize the oil market. No one wants prices up to $100 per barrel. Uh, you have to understand that uh, oil producers don't benefit from too high prices because this destroys the market. So, you know, when prices are too high, demand for, for, the, for the energy resource is also going down. So uh, countries don't want to see short-term gains in exchange for long-term loss of uh, interest in, in the consumption of oil and gas. Uh, so the perfect equilibrium for, I think, for oil and gas producing countries is around $80, $80, $90, because in this way they maximize profits, uh, they balance their budgets, and at the same time, prices are uh, affordable enough for consumers to keep on using oil and gas. Um, and, and Biden understands these logics, and, and all of these allies uh, in the Gulf uh, uh, also understand this logic. Uh, but I think, I think that um, whatever they do, whatever the United Arab Emirates does or Venezuela do, it is not enough to compensate the market share that Russia has on, on, on global markets. So uh, if Europe follows suit, because the US is not a big importer of Russian oil, it doesn't really matter if the US bans the import of Russian oil. But if Europe does it, then it would have catastrophic effect on the, on the global oil market. This will be a whole game changer. Having said that, we have already seen how European countries are trying to reduce their dependence on Russian crude. And as you can see, Russian crude is being traded at a discount of 25 to $30 per barrel. Uh, uh, so it's very hard for Russian companies to sell oil to, to Europe. So this is also driving prices up. I don't know how much oil needs to be released on the market in order for this to be compensated, but we're talking about millions of barrels. Uh, you know, per day. So a couple of millions of barrels probably per day. And I don't think that OPEC or Venezuela or, you know, all the whole bunch of these countries can actually muster 2 million barrels per day more of production at the moment. They don't want to do it. They, they, they can do it very quickly. At least that's my reading. So it will be very difficult to stabilize prices uh, to, to levels be below $100 until there is a peace settlement in, in, in Ukraine. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Stepanov. Uh, yeah, I also see this uh, sort of situation as economically and market driven because once you have a supply from one big supplier of oil is down, you will certainly need to find out other sources or to restrict, to, to lower the restrictions which exist on the supply side uh, from Venezuela and other uh, major providers of energy sources. And of course, uh, for Russia, United States market is not the, uh, the large sort of importer. It's, I think it's about two or 3% of total uh, exports of Russian oil, which goes to uh, the US market. But if we, if we take a look vice versa, I think about eight or 10% of all of the oil, which United States of America imports comes from Russia. And this is sort of a, uh, a little bit, I would say risky situation because it could, could, uh, could be a, a risk uh, in terms of um, growing uh, prices. Of course, the United States of America is a major producer of oil uh, by itself. And it could uh, potentially, uh, I would say when the, market, when the market price is growing, it's a, uh, provides a venue of opportunities for uh, shale producers, right? Because they could easily switch on their pr production uh, and could uh, 
uh, and could easily uh, start working, I would say, in, at least in comparison to a traditional oil and gas fields, uh, which is in Russia. The shale sort of economics works uh, more rapidly and uh, institutionally is designed in the way that it could, uh, could be more flexible to exchange. But I agree with Martin, it's, it's a big political and economic risk when the, the prices are so high and you don't have enough um, domestic opportunities and you don't have any other alternative to, substi to substitute. And this is the reason for this uh, political softening in the dialogue with other countries which, are, which have been banned like Venezuela and Iran. Thank you very much. We have a question from Martin. So is the upcoming energy crisis unprecedented? And uh, do you think this uh, step backwards from the Green Deal or just an obstacle in the way? Thank you very much. Mm, yeah, this is a million dollar question, right? Everyone wants to know that. Um, I think it's a bump in the way. I mean, the, I don't think the European Green Deal is going to be stopped because uh, it just makes economic sense. Look, this is, this is the bottom line. Um, renewables are just cheaper than everything else. If you look uh, at a comparison between uh, different new power generation units at a unit cost, you know, the cheapest source of energy of electricity is onshore wind. Is the cheapest that you can build. If you have one hundred, you know, if you have one million dollars, and you have to decide what to buy, you buy onshore wind because it just it is the cheapest thing. So um, these high prices actually uh, are going to incentivize uh, investors, businesses, households to think about alternatives. Think about how they can uh, move their money into something that's more cost effective so that they become more independent from the central energy system. Uh, and uh, I think this is the way forward. It will be difficult to achieve this uh, transformation in a decade. So I think uh, the whole process will be delayed. So I don't believe that the EU targets for 2030 for 55% reduction of emissions is possible. But uh, uh, the, whole, the whole process in general is inevitable in a way. Um, and uh, we can see that already uh, businesses are adapting to that. So if businesses are doing it, uh, then we know that we are going the, the right direction. Because when policymakers, you know, new level, uh, you, know, you know, give targets and, and write strategies, you know, you are skeptical because, you know, they have their visions without really talking to the final consumers and producers of energy. But when businesses themselves take this decision without consulting with policymakers, then you, you understand that uh, uh, the process has already started uh, and it cannot be turned back. No, I, I, I agree that uh, it's, it's really hard to forecast the scale of, of, of the crisis and the consequences and to compare this type of crisis with, with anything else. But uh, I think it will have uh, the short-term negative uh, implications for uh, energy ambitious of energy policy and climate policy, specifically at the European continent. But at the same time, as I said, the long-term sort of driving forces, uh, which, are, which are resulting from this kind of a lesson, new lessons learned um, and the, the, the uh, energy security risks, which are now sort of are, are so, so much tangible at European uh, Union level could give additional momentum to uh, even foster and even maybe to um, increase climate ambition of e EU in, 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 the, in the two or three years when the situation settles down. But of course, in the, in the coming year, there could be a dramatic issues with uh, energy prices and it would be a, a rollback, at least short-term rollback as we uh, have seen it uh, in, uh, after the 2000 eight and 2015 
when the coal consumption increased and the prices also were fluctuating dramatically. Thank you very much. We have one more question in the chat section from Shakrior uh, Ismail Kujayev, but unfortunately I cannot see him among us. Maybe he's some, he has some problems with the internet, doesn't matter. Uh, but his, his question is very interesting. Uh, he writes, uh, we see that the green idea is more popular in Western countries, not only on policy level, but in everyday life as well. And in the same time, we can see a big dose of skepticism in Eastern European countries and Russia as well. Why is this mind gap again between the East and the West? That's a, that's a brilliant question. Indeed, um, I mentioned during my presentation, and I think Ila also mentioned that, um, you have, the, you have the problem of tough dependencies in energy. Uh, when, when policymakers make one decision today, it has implications in the energy system for the next 10 years. Um, and it has been very difficult to change energy behavior and energy preferences in uh, Eastern Europe. And in general, in, in, the, in, in the East, if we can kind of divide the world in West and East. Um, and these path dependencies are based on a different style of managing the economy. So, um, you know, in a centralized, uh, centrally managed economies, um, the energy system is seen as a supporting agent to the production process. And in that sense, you know, Eastern, Central and Eastern European countries have preserved uh, the, the big role that uh, base load plants play, so nuclear uh, plants, uh, coal-fired power generation units, uh, because they believe that these are essential to maintaining the stability of the energy system, the pred predictability of supply, and low prices. So it's a big shock for many governments in the East that currently it is more expensive sometimes to produce this type of electricity than to produce the new technologies. So changing this mindset in people that they don't need to depend on the energy system to have you know, secure supply is quite difficult. And um, we have been trying to work with, with people on the ground, with uh, key stakeholders uh, to kind of you know, understand what determines their energy behavior. And I'll just give you one example. And this is very common for all Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, I'm sure it's very common in Russia. It's common in Ukraine. You know, this paradox with energy poverty and energy efficiency. When you are used to uh, receiving basically free electricity and free gas and free heating, you don't have incentive to save energy. So what is happening is that people in Eastern Europe think that a natural adequate temperature for the home, you know, is 25 degrees or like 24, 25 degrees temperature. In Western Europe, people believe that a normal temperature at home is 19 degrees Celsius because, you know, they're used to the fact that when you spend more energy to, to, to increase the temperature in your home, you're going to spend more money. This logic in Eastern Europe does not exist. You, you uh, uh, spend huge amounts of energy and you don't pay, you pay the same or, or, or you, you, your bill doesn't really increase much. So, you know, this joke that, you know, people would switch on eating to the maximum level and then open the windows in the winter because it's too hot at home. Now, I remember in my childhood, it was the same way. You know, we, we have the, the, the home, you know, so hot that you couldn't really live normally and so you need to open the windows ever and i've seen that in ukraine i've seen that in other parts of eastern europe so uh, this kind of mentality is very difficult to change so uh, uh, so basically households and businesses need to understand in eastern europe that they're not just passive consumers uh, that will be pampered and that will receive subsidies constantly but they are active participants in the energy system Mr. Stepano, do you want to add something? Yeah, I, I agree with this sort of uh, people dimension, but I would like to just to put on it into a more theoretical economic uh, 
perspective and just divide countries not uh, like uh, Western European or Eastern European, but uh, I would say the energy deficient uh, developed countries versus uh, less developed in terms of uh, per capita income and energy uh, I would say abundant countries like Russia and Kazakhstan, for example. And if you compare these cases, you see that they have different, I would say, alternative costs of energy transition. So if you take a look, for example, at Western Europe, which is pretty much energy deficient and need to import a lot of energy, and at the same time has a quite sufficient level of income, at least in comparison to Russia and Kazakhstan. You see that it is easier to sort of uh, change the behavior. It's easy to change, I would say, the energy mix. It's easier to combine climate policy goals with energy security and energy diversification goals. If you take a look at Russian case, for example, uh, no one really like at least um, two years ago, no one really talked about climate change issue at all. It was just, it has become on the agenda only recently due to EU CBAM predominantly and stuff like this. Uh, and this is mostly because it's really sort of hard to not only to change mentality, but only also to change sort of how in social institutions work, how economic institutions work, how uh, the government work because we have 70% of government budgets and all the of all the exports which comes from oil and gas. We have 15% of gross domestic product which comes from energy. We have uh, about 40% of um, total budget which comes from oil and gas. And in this case, when you reduce uh, production, when you change interfuel con 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 change conditions of interfuel competition, you just really risk of not being able to provide social infrastructure, not to provide enough jobs for us in Russia, coal industry or associated industries, about 1 million of people working there. And this is all the logic which really takes time to transform. And that is why I think it is really um, necessary to find the individu individual sort of solutions at the country level, at least for different groups of countries. One is, I would say developed and energy deficient countries, and there could be a really stringent carbon pricing pro policies and other things. And on the other hand, it could be case of uh, energy abundant economies and uh, economies in transition, which absolutely, absolutely needs uh, softer solutions and some uh, other options uh, on the way to achieve sustainable development goals uh, at their level. I would say something like this. Uh, thank you, and I would like to finish our discussion with one more question. Uh, maybe just a short answer is going to be enough. Um, well, we our, our university, and more precisely our faculty, is famous with its uh, situational analysis for the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and I've read uh, at least two reports argue that Russia needs to become greener. And even more, Russia needs to become the leader of this world green movement. But my question is, um, could this be, could this become the fundament, the new fund, uh, foundation of uh, European Russian relations in the future? Now, I'm not talking about the next two or three years, I'm talking about even more, but nevertheless, despite everything, um, we still have some common problems common world problems and climate change is one of them. Um, how, how do you think? Well, yeah, um, I mean, there has been a lot of talk of, about the energy transition in Russia itself. And, um, you know, Russia is not different than other oil and gas producers in the world in trying to invest uh, their, their revenues from selling oil and gas into uh, diversifying their portfolio, the energy portfolio. Uh, so of course, Russia has a huge potential in doing that. Uh, and look, it would also free up a lot of resources and it would optimize the sale of hydrocarbons uh, because, um, because of the uh, 
kind of the pricing policy in oil and gas domestically in Russia. And I'm, of course, I'm not a specialist in that, but uh, I have read a little bit uh, on this issue. You basically, um, you consume too much oil and gas at home, you know, and uh, a lot of this uh, uh, energy could be sold abroad at a much higher price. So this subsidization of, uh, uh, of domestic oil and gas consumption uh, can, uh, um, is basically, uh, is a big waste of resources. A lot of these resources can be used to actually replace the, the, the use of oil and gas with renewable energy uh, in, in Russia. And since you don't face you know, the, the CO2 emission price, for now, at least uh, until the Europe um, doesn't implement the CBAM, the, the carbon border adjustment mechanism, um, you can uh, basically uh, uh, proceed in, in developing, uh, for example, your own domestic hydrogen industry, uh, you know, uh, finance, you know, oil and gas companies can start financing renewable energy projects. This is done in, in the Gulf states you know, Gulf states uh, uh, investing enormous amounts of funds in that. Uh, Norway, look at Norway. Norway is one of the biggest oil and gas producers in Europe, uh, and um, it doesn't consume almost any oil and gas at home. So it produces electricity from hydropower. It invests in offshore wind, one of the biggest investors in offshore wind. So Russia can do that as well. So it can minimize uh, its own use of uh, hydrocarbons, and in this way, incentivize uh, companies to to put put their money into renewable energy. You know, Russia is the biggest country in the world, so you have enormous territories to use for solar. Uh, you know, power uh, for wind. You know, you have territories with high winds. In why not? Um, not to mention biomass. In, 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 <laughs> not to say Birian taiga can be the source of you know basically eternal uh, biomass uh, uh, production uh, for power, for, for heating, etc. Et so, uh, so there are a lot of options uh, out there. Uh, also synthetic fuels. Um, you have also the R&D capacity. So Russia has the R&D capacity to, uh, to move this industry forward. Uh, you have the educated labor force, uh, scientists. Uh, so so it's, it's a matter of policy direction, really. In the end of the day, uh, it's whether the Russian government wants to uh, be locked in in its own dependence on oil and gas or whether it wants to diversify its economy further. Uh, yeah, just an add on that, well, traditionally in the literature, you can find different sort of explanations why it is bad to depend on exports of fossil fuels because there could be real exchange rate fluctuations, there could be different other like vulnerabilities when you just really depend but on, 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 on this kind of experts and there could be a risk of bad political institutions of, because of excessive dependence on resource rates and, and stuff like this. But during the last decades or two, on top of this, there is a macrostructural risk of global energy transition, which is something new and which is not um, like to a, a sufficient extent is now taking into account in Russia. And this is, I think, the most, uh, the main driving force, which could become really a, a matter of change in Russia and realizing this kind of risks. Um, also, it's not only EU CBAM, which is, we prepared a report with the World Bank and the estimate of the uh, EU CBAM could, uh, are not like that, that, that's uh, critical for Russia because some of these um, trade uh, flows could be exchanged for re geographical redirection and, and, and stuff like this. So it, it should not be exaggerated, but at least it was a signal that it could be a really good, bad restriction for a trade in carbon intensive goods. And there are other risks like reduced demand just for energy uh, uh, experts financial risks because a lot of uh, institutional investors are now withdrawing assets from oil and gas, let alone coal. Technological um, risks connected to competition uh, and increased competitiveness of renewable energies globally and on different markets. So I think this, uh, at least during the last two years, have 
really uh, pushed forward the climate agenda in Russia. At least uh, I can judge uh, uh, working uh, for administration of president. We have different applied projects for Sakhalin and for, for, for regions which are now really thinking on climate policies, primarily because of EUC ban. And, um, and then they could step to uh, find some tangible opportunities for, for, for themselves. Because as Martin said, there could be immense opportunities for climate smart mining, climate smart forestry, for even LNG, because you see that natural gas, especially at Asian markets, could be really a promising energy source and it is uh, less carbon intensive and climate uh, policies in Russia can uh, really foster and increase com com competitiveness of natural gas, at least uh, in comparison to coal. And there are other different solutions and rare earth metals which are vital for el electronics and stuff like this. So um, I think these risks are, are being realized, at least the, the Russian government started to realize them during the last few years. However, the situation changed two, two weeks ago and we will see how, how, it, how it will uh, develop uh, further on. Well, thank you very much. It was a great pleasure to host you. And I think that this is maybe one of the most interesting meetings that we actually held. Uh, I want especially to thank to Mr. Uh, Vladimirov and Mr. Sipanov for accepting our invitation. And we really hope that uh, there are going to be more meetings like this one. Uh, thank you all for participating. Thank you all for your questions. Hope to see you soon on our next seminar. And of course, stay, stay safe. Thank you and have a nice night.